So thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, today we have Foreman Community Demo number 118. Uh, today we have a pretty packed agenda. So let's just start with uh, Jeremy, who will be talking about Errata Overview Card. Go ahead, Jeremy. Oh, starting right off. OK, thanks, Maria. Uh, let me share quickly. All right, so uh, I want to tell you about some improvements we've made to Arata Overview Card. This will be a very short demo, uh, probably just a minute. So um, as you may know or may remember, there's two types of Arata in Cotillo. There's applicable and installable. So applicable are uh, Arata that apply to a package that you have installed on your host. And then installable is a subset of that, which is uh, actually available in the host content view and lifecycle environment. Uh, so previously, this uh, errata overview card that we have here on the new host details UI was just installable errata. Uh, but we got some feedback that users wanted to see applicable as well. So we've added a nice little toggle group here. And uh, you can switch between them. If you have different numbers of them, the chart will update. And uh, we've also added some helpful tool tips in case you forget the definitions of these terms, which I forget all the time. Um, also, these links here go to the correct filters. So if I select applicable and I click this link here, I'm taken to the errata tab, and applicable is selected for me. And we've added the tool tips here as well, by the way. And then if I select installable and I click this link, installable will be selected for me. And then as always, these uh, smaller links have the uh, filters applied as well. Uh, but we've, we've added applicable and installable to these as well. So if I want to just see installable security advisories, I can do that. And I have installable selected here and then security is selected for me here. So. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's it for my demo. Let's see if there's any questions. If not, we can just move right along. Thank you, Jeremy, for your demo. If you have any questions, feel free to post it in the comment section in our YouTube video. And now uh, there is a Chris Roberts going to talk about new OS page in the host details. Yeah, this will be a, a quick demo too. Uh, so let me just go ahead and share my screen here. Uh, so let me. So we added basically on the new. There's a on the details tab here. Part of the new host details. Uh, there's this operating system card, which has already been there. But one thing that we did add was the kernel release. Um, I know that was something that was requested by customers. Uh, and what's really cool about this is actually if you don't have the, the way we added this in the back end, Foreman has this thing called a fact parser. And Foreman people, may, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but um, so it, it pulls facts from Puppet, Ansible, and uh, Subscription Manager. So if you don't have Catello, this will still show up. Whereas before, the way we first approached this, if you didn't have Catello, it wouldn't show up. So if you are just a Foreman user, you'll still have uh, this fact. And we're actually adding a few more facts this way as well. Uh, which will complement uh, some of these other uh, values in here as well. And that's all I had for that page. I'll go ahead and stop sharing. Thank you, Chris. Again, the questions under the video on YouTube. Uh, the next on is Lucy, who will be showing us a linkage between uh, host pages. Thank you, Maria. Let me share my screen. So in this demo, I'm going to show you a change in Content Hosts UI. On the page of Content Hosts, there's a link to each one of the uh, host instance. Click on one of the links. This is the page you will get. That's pretty familiar. 
Starting with Catano 4.7 uh, from the same content host link, you can get to the new host details page. To do that, you have to change your setting first. On the Nagenano tab, the new host details UI. You change this setting to yes. Go back to content hosts. Click on the same link. You get the new host details page. That's what I have for today. Thank you very much, Lucy. I hope this will be useful for a lot of folks. Uh, the next one is Maria, who will talk about templates card in host detail page. Hello. I'm gonna also share screen. And in the host detail page, under the details tab, we have actually two new cards that I'm showing. This is the provisioning card that I don't have any info, but it's here now. And we also have the provisioning templates card. Um, clicking on the pencil will lead you to the edit page for this template. Clicking on the name of the template will open this uh, model where you can see the preview of the template. You can open the template in a new page. I don't know why is it behaving weird, but stable usually. Um, you can open it in a new tab, which is what happened in the old page. You can change the safe mode and you can copy all of the text here to your clipboard. And of course, you can also go to the edit page here. And if I click on open new tab, you will see the text only without any pretty UI. So you can just copy it or view it uh, in a clean way. And yeah, that's it for me. Thank you, Maria. Uh, the next one is Jan, who will be talking about host all installed packages report. All right, thanks, Maria. I'll get my screen shared. Okay, so um, I actually have two demos. This first one will be a bit short, just a quick overview of a new report template that we have. Um, so we never had a way before to show simply all of the installed packages that a host has. Um, I'm assuming other people probably wrote their own templates to do that if they needed it. Uh, but now it comes available out of the box. Um, so it's a pretty simple template. Uh, it just shows the host's name um, along with the name of the package and then the, uh, the Nevra or the Nevra with the uh, Epic. Um, we have a host filter, so you don't have to show it for all of your hosts. In fact, I would highly recommend doing that. If you have 10,000 hosts, this is probably going to be a pretty chunky Excel spreadsheet. Um, so I'll just show quickly how it works. When you generate all installed packages, um, you'll be prompted, like usual, to have some kind of input. So we have a host filter. I'll just filter on the name to show. Just like you're used to in Foreman, it'll show up with, it'll pop up any of these um, uh, suggestions. And I'll just give this a generate. And I'll just show you what it looks like. For some reason, my LibreOffice is blurry. I don't know why. Apologies. But yeah, you can see the host. You can see the package name. And then you can see some more information about it right here. And as always, if you want to build on this, you can clone it and customize it however you want. Awesome. I'm going to continue on with my next demo. 
Um, so this is getting more into the Gatello side of things. We have a new alternate content sources type um, that was developed by Lucy. Um, and it is the Rui type. For anyone who doesn't know what Rui is, um, it stands for the Red Hat Update Infrastructure. And pretty much it's a solution for having, for hosting your own uh, remote Red Hat CDN, essentially. So you can have all of your Red Hat repositories closer to your infrastructure. Uh, you can also have custom repositories on it if you want as well. Um, and some folks use that. And what this allows you to do is instead of having your, uh, your smart proxies sync either from your Catello instance or having it sync via the simplified ACS that I talked about in a prior demo sync to the CDN, you can now have it sync uh, to actually a Rui instance. Now, this iteration of the Rui alternate content source type is essentially a custom alternate content source with guided steps. So you still need to go out and get the proper information from the, uh, the management node in your Rui uh, system. But we give you some steps and some copy and paste help to make that easy. So I'll show it off here. So you see now we have some nice descriptions under the, the content source types. And you have Rui here. Rui only supports yum. So this is displayed still, but it's grayed out. Now, the very first thing you'll see here is a little warning, a little reminder. For Rui, you're going to need certificates to talk to the server. Um, and we don't want you to go through all the way through the wizard just to find out you have to create some and exit and waste your time. So we have a warning right here with a copy and paste that you can do to generate these certificates. All you need to do is replace this placeholder we have at the end with the labels of your repositories in Rui. Um, and then that will actually create the certs for you. And we have a handy link here that will bring you to the content credentials page. Um, so you can create these content credentials. And I'll just show you real quick. So I have a Ruby instance up right here. So um, I have some certificates that I've created. I'll just show the names. Um, and that was the result of this Ruby manager client cert command. Um, and these certificates, uh, they're customizable, so they'll be applicable to any repository you pass in via this repo label um, argument. So most of this will look similar to custom. You can give it a name, and then you select your smart proxies as you wish. Now this is where things start getting a little bit more helpful. So. The base URL needs to look a certain way. Um, and it should, uh, for a Rui instance, always look something like your Rui server's host name and then slash pulp slash content, because that's where the content is stored in pulp. Um, so for example, for the server I have, um, we could just give an example like https colon slash slash Rui example com and if you mess it up it'll warn you and it won't let you keep going so you got to stick the, the pulp content at the end and then it's happy so a couple things that are nice here um, the thing that can be difficult is you got to find these sub paths and for now um, it has to be list one by one because that's just how Ruby works um, but what we do is you can we give you the command for listing the re repositories in Ruby so I will list this out. That didn't copy, right? Here we go. And then you can see all these uh, Red Hat repositories we have. And then you can look, let's say we want this uh, rel7 Ansible one. We can grab the ID. And then we just need to use this uh, Ruby Manager repo info command. So copy this. I think I just went over my copy paste. So here's this, for example. Uh, 
And the important thing here, as we note, we say find the relative path. So the relative path is noted here. And you'll just copy and paste this into here. And then you'll have a comma. And then you'll add all the other repositories that you need. Um, we're trying to work on making this more convenient. Um, but this seems like a fine solution for now because people should not be needing to make alternate content sources very often. It really should be uh, something you do, like the first thing you know, when you're first setting up your Catello instance with Rui, and then you forget about it because it'll just always be there, unless you need to add more repositories. But then if you have to do that, you can just go in and edit the ACS. You don't have to create a new one. So we'll hit next here. Um, and then the last thing is to select the certificates. So you just need a cert and a key for your Rui. Um, if you wish to verify SSL, um, which uh, you should, you'll be you'll need to enter in the CA certificate for your Rui. I don't happen to have one here. And then at the very end, you can review everything you have. I won't create this one because the certificates aren't set up properly. But I can just show you one that I have already created. And you can see all the details here. You can view the details, the smart proxies. You can see the URL and the subpaths. So you can see I have a few. Uh, let's see, yeah, I have three repos in there. And then you can check out the credentials. And then once you refresh your source, uh, it'll be available. And the next time you do a sync on either your main system, if you configured your your uh, primary smart proxy to be on that ACS, or any of your remote smart proxies will get, will download the data, um, your, the content packages from Rui instead of whatever the upstream source is, either the Catello itself, if it's a smart proxy, or the upstream source. And let me think if there's anything else worth mentioning. I think that is it. Yeah, so that, that concludes my demo. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, now Samir will continue with more improvements uh, on ACSs. Thanks, Maria. Uh, let me share my screen. All right, can you see my screen OK? Yes. All right, let me get started. So first thing to note is I'm logged in as the admin user because uh, later on in this demo, I'll uh, present some permissions uh, updates. So for now, as an admin user, this is the screen I look at. So I have this add source button and next to all of the uh, alternate content sources, I have the row action. So you can delete and refresh if you have the permissions to. And we have sorting on off on this table uh let's say you wanted to see the details of one of these so you'll notice the details opens as a side pane and also uh the uh, row that you selected will get highlighted and it will take a different color i don't know if you can see that but uh there's uh this is the selected row and then you have the side panes you have all of your edit commands, these will open models based on what you want to edit. And let's just go through the wizard once again in detail, although uh, Ian did go through that. But some things to highlight here are these steps will all be enabled and disabled based on whether you have completed everything in the previous step. And there are also some validations that have been added. So let me give it some name here. So for example, you cannot move on to the next step unless you have at least one smart proxy selected. Similarly for, oh, so this is custom. So the validation here is around the base URL. So if I were to put this, it will turn green. But if I were to do something like this, it will tell you what formats of URLs are allowed. So it will make you type that. And if you notice, the next button and the next step also goes uh, disabled. 
Similarly, for subpaths, so if you have something like this, it will notify you that this is not uh, the correct format. So you need, so this error, if you read through this, it should be a comma separated list of subpaths if you have multiple. And all subpaths must have a slash in the end. So this is how you do that. You can always go back to things, change them. You can do a review. And similarly for content credentials, if I have nothing, then it will be the next will be enabled. But if I were to choose say manual authentication, it will go disabled again unless I populate the required field here, which is username. Once I do that, this will come back again. So these are some of the validations we have added in the wizard. These are necessary because we want to let users avoid some of the common mistakes because what happens when you create this ACS is that it's a long running task informant and it could fail like at the finalized phase and you would like you'd have to start over again. So all right. So that is all I had. And thanks Ian for adding all the bulk actions here. So now you have these bulk actions. You can refresh all of the ACSs that you have selected. You can delete in bulk. All right, let's move on to the next part, which is around permissions. So I have a couple of users here. So admin is what I was uh, demoing as. Then I have a test user. This user has viewer permissions on everything. So let me impersonate this user with the viewer role. And let me refresh, or let me just go back. All right. So this is how the UI looks for a person with only view permissions and no delete and edit. So you'll see all the row actions are gone. The create button is gone. You can still view details of an ACS. But if you notice, all the edit links are gone. The refresh is gone. So this is for the viewer role. And if I were to stop impersonating. And I have a user without viewer permissions even. So let me do that. And let me, let's say, go back to this. So if you don't have your permissions, you should get an access denied. And it will tell you what your required permissions are. And for this user, I removed alternate content source view permissions. So you won't see the navigation menu at all. And if you were to like directly go to the URL. This is the screen that you'll see here. All right, I think that is all I had for today. Uh, I mean, for this demo. Thank you very much, Samir. So to continue with alternate content sources, um, Chris Roberts come back to tell us even more. <laughs> all right, let me uh, share my screen here. This will be a quick one. Alrighty. So the first thing that I wanted to show is that we actually, since we pretty much are finished up with the alternate content source feature, uh, we used to be under lab features here. So we move that now onto the content section. So I'm going to go ahead and the next piece I'm going to show is um, what we've done to content credentials. So I have a ACS here. And if I go into that, I have credentials. I have a, a CA a client certificate, the key would be the same in the next page. I'll show you. I just didn't want to bother with it. I was kind of lazy. So um, if we go to content credentials here, um, we can actually see. So I have my CA, my cert. We've, we've updated this field here to show that they are inside of a content credential. And the cool part about this is if I actually click on here, we have a new tab now called alternate content sources. And it's actually, it will say what it's used as. It will take me to the ACS. So before I do that, I'll show you what the the, C, the client cert looks like. So let me go back. 
and we got alternate content source. You can see that it's used as a different piece. And then I can click on this, on the name here, and it will actually take me to the ACS. Um, and again, we can edit here. Um, and that's all I had for that. Yeah, so we've got it basically content credentials you can find and map. Thank you very much. And now, uh, return Samir again to talk about content view version comparison improvements. Thanks, Maria. Let me share my window. All right, let's see what we have here. So I have a test, uh, like a demo content view here called CV1. I have some versions published here. So on this screen, you'll see, for example, the version one has 22 packages and version four has 15. Uh, there's also a filter involved. So I have a zebra include filter here, which does what it says. It includes the zebra package. So if I were to want to see what differences actually exist between these two versions, I'd go to compare. So the improvements here are basically we have added the repositories sub tab here. So you can see what changed between the two versions if there were repositories added. So for example, I can see that this repository applicable errata was added in version four. Similarly for RPM packages, you can always filter by different same. So you'll see what exists in one versus the other. We have also added uh, sorting here. So you can sort based on stuff you see here. You have sorting in all of the all of these sub tabs now. So you can use that. And I think that is all I had for this uh, CV version compare. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Samir. It was interesting to finally see this. Um, so, and can the last question, one. Please? Yes, question. Uh, Samir, uh, if you can share the screen again, I, I was not sure about uh, how do I find from the diff, if there is the same package, how do I tell uh, what version of the package is in each content view version? Like, is that, uh, is the same package as two rows? And once I would see it's in version one and the second row would show me a different version in version four. I'm not sure if the question is, oh, I see it now, I guess. There's a duck 06, duck 07, and it's in both. You're muted, Samir, if you're talking. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, so I was saying, if you were to filter one of these versions out from the next version, for example, then you would be able to see which version exists in uh, which, yeah, which package version exists in which content view version, for example. So we have some of the most useful information right here on the table. That should be helpful. Does that make sense? Yeah, so for example, if I see Elephant Open 3 is in version 1.0 and it's no longer in version 4.0, um, okay. is, is it possible that Elephant would also be released, let's say, 0.5 and it would be only in version 4? And if that's the case, how would I see it in this table? So those would be separate packages as far as Catello is concerned, because if the Nevra is different, so if the version itself is different, that those would be treated as separate records in Catello. So those would appear as two different rows. OK, got it. Thank you. Any more questions? If not, next one is Leosh, who will show us provisioning Cruel 9. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Hi. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about template changes for the provisioning of Morel 9 machines. Uh, as you can see, this bugzilla, there was an issue where running update of packages and kernel in the port section during the kickstart uh, didn't run well for the Rail 9 machines. And on the reboot of the machine, the 
incorrect version of kernel was loaded and the system ended in the emergency mode. Uh, the temporary workaround for that was to set package upgrade during the in provisioning to false. So then you have to do it manually or with you know Ansible or remote execution. But that wasn't actually like really nice to customers. So we found fix with new Anaconda command for RHSM and for actually registering the host during the provisioning. And we did some changes in the templates. So here we have new snippet called kickstart rhsm which is basically uh preparing the command you know for setting up the organization activation keys and all the stuff necessary for the registration like you know uh satellite or foreman url and so on and also connecting to insights if you want to you know report your hosts to the insights and you can of course set up some system roles usage and stuff like that then in the kickstart default template we rendered that so here you can see this is this is the preview of the template for my royal nine host and you can see here that anaconda rhsm command with all the data uh, required for the registration and here still we still do the update if you want to in the port section and that's basically it i'm not going to show up the provisioning because that would take like several minutes and yeah you wouldn't see anything interesting uh what i want to mention is yeah this fix is going to be in 3.5 and also in upcoming 3.4 version fix so users who will be migrating from 3.3 to 3.4 will get this fix too and yes that's everything from me thank you Laos. do you have any questions okay this seems to be the end of our agenda, but uh, I have a small sneak peek uh, I would like to share with you. So as you know, we have uh, two host index pages, all host and uh, content hosts. We are going to unify them in upcoming releases. And also we need to unify actions uh, that are there. So uh, keep in mind that this work is still in progress. And so um, to combine all the actions uh, for these two pages, we firstly uh, met everything that was there and then uh, with developers and other people we try to combine them uh, and group them and this is a small sneak peek again work in progress how it can look like so for actions we have manage content with uh, manage packages errata module streams repository set system purpose content source lifecycle environment it would open also redesign uh, models. And then we have change host affiliation. It would be everything would be a flyout. That means uh, it will open the second part of the uh, action navigation would open on hover. So you don't need to click. Uh, so change host affiliation would be uh, for host group, host collections, owner, and assign location and organization that would be in one model altogether. Build management would uh, encompass uh, three different actions, such as uh, build host, disassociate host, and rebuild config. And then we have configuration notifications, which um, in current state is just enable and disable notifications and enable traces which right now is just manage traces and of course delete other global actions are 
uh, create, host, register, and of course, uh, schedule job would work the same way as it works in host detail page right now. So this is a small sneak peek. Uh, there will be more research uh, coming also uh, in community. So there will be questionnaire or something like that. So feel free to comment. And that's everything from me. Thank you very much for joining today's demo. And we will see you in a couple of weeks. Thanks all. Have a good one.